Grace and peace, family. Pastor Derek here. Man, what a wonderful time in worship that was. Listen, we are so grateful to be connected to a family of churches like the Epiphany Network of Churches, where we get to call on our brothers and sisters across the country to serve us and to aid us in doing the gospel ministry that God has called us to do. And so we just had the opportunity to hear worship be led by our family down in Baltimore. Man, they are doing a great work down there. And so listen, with that, we're going to have today as a guest speaker, my brother and my friend, Pastor Trevor Chen. His wife just led worship for us, and he is going to bring the word of God for us today. And so he's the executive pastor at Epiphany Church in Baltimore, Maryland. And so I want you guys to lock in and zoom into the word of God as he comes to preach for us today. And then also we look forward to connecting with you directly after service at 12 p.m. for our time to meet the Coleman's. So you guys get to meet our church planting resident family on Zoom, you get to ask them questions and hear their story a little bit. And so we're just excited about all that God is doing in the life of our church. And so let's prepare our hearts for the word of God. Why? Because we love the word here at Epiphany Church. And so welcome. Do some hallelujah hands and some emoji hearts and all that kind of stuff for Pastor Trevor Chen of Epiphany Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Grace and peace, family. We love you. What's going on, family? Welcome to Epiphany Church. I am Pastor Trev. It is so good to be with you uh, together today. Listen, I want to jump right in as we get rolling this morning. We've been going through our Prayer 101 series, and uh, it's been a joy. It's been a blessing. I pray that it's been a blessing to you, but, uh, but we've been going through a series called Prayer 101, How to Live a Praying Life. Um, and, and we've been working to do the, we've been looking to do the work of, uh, of shaping our lives around having a culture of prayer, shaping our lives around prayer through prayer for prayer to be a first offense and not a last resort. We just got to see, uh, the greatest player of all time, uh, win a championship, um, with the Lakers a few weeks ago. Listen, don't at me. I said what I said. Uh, I am, a, I'm not a bandwagon dude. I'm a LeBron fan. So, uh, keep all the little commentary to yourself, but I just saw it happen. But, but, uh, while I was watching replays, one of the commentators said, uh, he flipped a famous phrase and he said, sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Sometimes the best defense is a good offense. In other words, if we take control of the game early on, the defense will play its own game. And this could be said about our own prayer lives. That oftentimes we go to God in prayer when something crazy comes up in our lives or uh, 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 when something is bothering us or an issue takes place. But, 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 but the best defense is a good offense. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Pray, prayer isn't something that, that coddles us when we're feeling low, uh, but prayer is a battle ax that, 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 that walks us out into battle. Prayer is not a passive good luck charm. Prayer Prayer is breaking out of space and time and pleading with God to fight for us on our behalf. Prayer is war. Prayer is battle. Prayer is finding the balance between giving praise to God with one hand and fighting the enemy with the other. And that is one of the things that I want to talk about this morning as we as as, as we go are going deeper into this prayer one-on-one series of 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 doing the work of fighting this battle in prayer. This past weekend, I had the amazing opportunity to be able to go to a, a drive through safari or something like that. It was down in DC area and uh, uh, you would stay in your car. And uh, it was interesting because you stay in your car, you drive through, you get, you get the most expensive carrots known to man. Um, but, uh, 
<laughs> you get to feed the feed the llamas and the cows that come up to the uh, windows of the car. You get to, you got to feed them the carrots. And one of the more interesting things was that that uh, there was a llama that was in there. Now it's kind of on a it's a good amount of space, but there's like a reservation or an open field, and there was a llama that was on a leash. Now it, it it looked interesting. It was fun, you know. The kids got to uh, put carrots out the window and stuff like that. They were scared to death, but um, that got to happen. But the 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 interesting thing about a llama is that a llama can run up to forty miles per hour. Forty miles per hour, but because of the restraints and the constrictions that was on him. He could only go as fast or as far as the one who was holding the leash would allow him to go. He didn't have free reign. He couldn't go as fast or as far as he wanted to because he was in a controlled setting and he was in constraints. Epiphany so often that llama is our prayer lives and we are the ones that hold the leash on net, not letting it go too far or not letting it go too fast. And we hold that llama back. We hold our prayer lives back because of our insecurities. We hold it back because of our doubt. We hold it back because of our view of God. We hold it back by our view on prayer. We hold it back because we want to avoid battle. And today I want to make the plea that we need to have our prayer lives unleashed. That's the title of my sermon this morning. The idea that I want to talk about is pr from is prayer unleashed. And I want to look at three specific verses that talk about this concept of our prayer life. And, 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 and the, the one who we're going to look at prayer life is Jesus. And, and, and I wanted to do that because I'm like, Listen, if Jesus prayed, if, 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 if Jesus prayed, how much more should we pray? But there are, there are a few things that I want you to notice um, in saying that, that, that prayer is a battle. First, the first idea is unleashing your prayer helps you before the battle. Unleashing your prayer helps you during the battle. And unleashing your prayers brings you through the battle. Before the battle, during the battle, through the battle. And the first idea, the first one that I want to look at is, um, is Jesus in the desert. Jesus in the desert. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4. And I'll read for your hearing. Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. For 40 days to be tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time, the devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all of the authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, it will all become yours. And Jesus answered him, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give angels orders concerning you to protect you. And they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. The first idea that I want to talk about is Jesus in the desert. There's a few things that are happening here and we get dropped off in the in the middle of a story and as soon as Jesus gets baptized, immediately after he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And I love how the writer of Luke points out the amount of time that Jesus was out in the wilderness because it should attach readers to other times in Scripture where 40 days was important. In Exodus 34, verse 28, Moses went out and spent 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai without food or water. 
In Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3, the people of Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness where they complained that they would die from hunger. Elijah, in 1 Kings 9, 19, verse 8, journeyed for 40 days without food. In other words, this 40 days would connect Jesus with the most significant and uh, significant people and events in history. And here, now Jesus would connect himself in prayer and fasting. And it was done in the past to show not only his divine nature, but his human nature as well. He was fully God, yes, but he was also fully man. And this passage would show that well, but, but Jesus was led into the wilderness. And I want I, I want to paint the scene because I really, again, and I know we say it all the time, I feel like we can have these, these whatever views, these are like, I want to paint the scene of, the, of what is going on. I want you to think an empty area. I want you to, the, 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 the place is literally called the devastation. Jesus spent 40 days fasting out there. Imagine the time that he had with the Father. Imagine the prayers. Imagine how he was feeling. Imagine his hunger. Imagine his pain and agony. The seeming loneliness. Immediately at the end of this prayer and fasting, the devil shows up with three tests. He said, hey, you're hungry. Turn this bread into stone. He had the ability to do so. He could have done it if he wanted to. But Jesus quoted Deuteronomy saying, man shall not live by bread alone. And the second temptation, the, the devil told Jesus that if you worship me, if you worship me, you'll receive all authority, all power, all kingdoms, all that kind of good stuff. And it's interesting here, if I can take a parenthetical pause, it's interesting that Satan offered Jesus not only something he didn't have the authority to offer, but what Jesus already had. We can do this oftentimes with temptation as well. Everything that we surround in our world, they offer us peace or they offer us happiness or they offer us wealth, but they do not have the authority to do so, nor are they authentic gifts. But we now have for those who are in Jesus, for those who are in Jesus, we have peace in the perfect man of peace. We have joy in, in the perfect man who offers joy because of the good news of the gospel, because of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We now with open arms can go to the Father, ask for what we need, have, have unlimited, unadulterated access to Jesus. But to move on, Jesus responded by quoting scripture to the devil again. He said from Deuteronomy 6, 13, he says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. A third temptation came across. He said, well, listen, since you say you're the son of God, throw yourself down and get back up. And again, Jesus quotes another verse from Deuteronomy saying, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Three separate ways that Jesus was tested. Three ways after spending the 40 day period of prayer and fasting. And it caused me to ask the question. One of the things that, 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 that you'll see when you're kind of reading, going through scriptures, kind of asking the questions of how's and the why's and what are the implications of that. And one of the things was like, how was that possible? What was the purpose of, uh, of Luke telling us this story in the manner that he did? And, 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 and it, it, it brought me to realize that Jesus conquered temptation three because of three ways. One, Jesus conquered temptation because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Just before our passage, you'll see in um, that when he was baptized, the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Jesus conquered temptation because he was full of the Holy Spirit. For those who are in Christ, we now, we now have that same access and that same joy because the Spirit dwells in us. Secondly, Jesus conquered temptation because he was led by the Spirit. You'll see at the beginning of chapter four that 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 full of the Spirit and was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. And lastly, Jesus conquered temptation because he was filled with God's word. You see that in every way that 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 Jesus responded to the devil, he responded to him with 
his word. Yes, he was physically weak, but he was spiritually strong. And I look at this verse and oftentimes we'll say things like, ain't that just like the enemy? After we pray and after we try to get our lives together, he going to show up and do X, Y, Z. And, 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 and we can, we, we can take that. But I think that we might look at that wrong because how, how, how much stronger, how much stronger would Jesus have been uh, as he spent that time in praying in fasting? How much stronger would have Jesus have been to have the ability to be able to resist those temptations before the battle Jesus prepared for the battle in prayer this is the idea of staying ready so you don't have to get ready prayer unleashes power that you didn't know was possible in other words when you spend time with God in prayer when you spend time pleading with God something in you begins to shift something in you begins to happen this this self-made self-made idea is replaced with reliance on God the, the the intimacy gets deeper the spirit that dwells in you bubbles up the communion that creation has with the creator become solidified and strength and easy temptations become less enticing. That's why a regular prayer life is so important. One of the ways, and I, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but one of the things that I had to uh, process through was was finding different ways in different spaces to be able to pray to God. And one of the ways that I found that I, I'll tell you about that later, but one of the ways that I found was, was, was walking in nature, was walking trails. So I've been taking my kids on these trails with me. And um, oftentimes we'll be walking down and there'll be like a, like a little small trail that goes to the side or even uh, a wide trail that like, it'll be a fork in the road that seems to go two different ways. And my, my daughter would ask, Daddy, why does the road go this way too? And I would tell her that a trail is just the woods that were consistently traveled on. In other words, a trail through the woods happens when people consistently walk down them, trampling on the grass, trampling on the weeds, breaking up the sticks, breaking through the branches. And when people would do the difficult work of forcing their way through an area, but once they're done, a clear path would make it easier for them when it was time to walk down that trail. Again, family, can I tell you that, 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 that us having communion with God, going to God, will going to God will continue to step on the spiritual weeds and the spiritual grass that block our way to intimacy. But the more you do the work of fighting to get to the place, the more you do the work of, of trampling through those weeds, the more you do the work of trying to find that space, the more you do the work of trying to find that place. An easier and a more regular, genuine intimacy can become. I want to encourage you, even now, even in this season, to continue to fight for the spaces, continue to fight for the places, continue to fight for that intimacy, continue to, 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 to pull out your spiritual machete and to continue to chop and, 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 and uh, uh, chop your way and make your way through different areas of your life and fight for that intimacy with God. Because I'll argue that our prayer life is the only intimate part of our life that we don't continue to keep refreshed, new, and spiced up. We work out to keep our bodies in some kind of shape. Don't, don't, don't know what shape it is, but some kind of shape. We wash our clothes to keep uh, them clean. In our marriages, we change up date night so, so we can keep the relationship fresh with our kids. We'll take our kids to different parts of different places so they don't get bored. In every intimate place of our lives, we work hard to keep it consistent and new. But in our prayer lives, we can go months or years of feeling like I can't get that same level of intimacy or that I once had or, or it's hard to pray or I don't feel like praying or, 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 or trying to get to that space or that place feels difficult. Yet we do nothing to keep it refreshed and new. And I, you know I wouldn't say that without trying to give us a practical way to help that off, but, 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 but we, we, we push it off. We, 
We push it away. We numb ourselves. We busy ourselves. And I could be, and if I could be very transparent, if I can keep it a buck, this is something that I felt this year. There was things that I was running from, things that I was blocking up. There was the, the, there was there was the intimacy that I just felt. There was a disconnection. Now I know a, a global pandemic didn't help, but I knew that there was things in my life that, that, that there was things that were happening that I just didn't feel like I can get that space or get to that place. And I knew there was something that I needed to do, so I I I I, I tried to read. I talked about it, um, and one of the books that I ran into was was a book called Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. And I knew there was something that I needed to do for my prayer life. So I began to search for what that thing was. And John Eldridge kind of became a, a trusted voice for me during those times. And the book started off with the story of a lion that was captured for a circus. And at night throughout the entire town, you could hear the lion roar. But over the years, the roars became more and more faint. And he talked about the power of a lion and the capability of a lion. But because he was caged, John Eldridge says this. For after years of living in a cage, a lion no longer even believes it's a lion. And a man no longer believes he's a man. And I had to ask myself, what am I locking up? What am I holding back on? So I dug deeper and found another quote. There is something else that I'm after out here in the wild. I'm searching for an even more elusive prey. Something that only that can only be found through the help of the wilderness. I am looking for my heart. And in that moment, I realized that I needed the adventure. In that moment, I knew that I needed some nature. And so I, I would, I, I would, I would, I needed to get out of the house. I needed to see God's creation. And, and, and something happened when, when that happened for me personally. I, 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 I realized that this is how I can hear from God. I would pace the floors at home, but it just wasn't the same. I would try to find spaces at the crib, but it wasn't the same. I would even try to sit on the front porch, but it wasn't the same. But when I would get outside, when I would get in the woods, when I, 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 when I would get alone, when I was getting in nature, I could hear from God. And I finally found like this is it. This is what I needed to do a few weeks ago. Uh, Pastor Charlie and Ernest and I had the opportunity to, uh, to go with um, St. Moses. Uh, and a few of the folk over there uh, to uh, on a trail uh, for a portion of the Appalachian Trail. Um, it was unique. Um, it was good. Listen, it, it was it was an experience, but I didn't have fun. You know, I now I would do it again. I want to do it again, but uh, nonetheless, that's a whole other story. But uh, it was it was very interesting. We we were we were out there and walking in the woods and 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 being in nature and through some conversations uh, beforehand. Because I asked one of the guys that we were going with, like, "Hey, listen, like, like what, like what, what can you expect? What do you expect?" And all of these different things. And, and and one thing became very evident for me that the lives that we create for ourselves. The comfort that we surround ourselves and all of us that are watching, if, especially if you're this far into this video, you're very comfortable. The temperature is set to a certain place. The clothes that you have on, have you set in a certain place? The Wi-Fi is still working. The couch that you got, you and your, you know I mean, the, the perfect spot where, where you're comfortable. Like we, we, we become the conductors of our own lives. And the more we create the world around us, the more that we can forget that we, that, that we are relying on God. Because we are the ones that are creating our own experience based on our comfort. But there was something that happened when, 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 when you would stand on the edge of a rock and see out uh, uh, of miles and miles of trees and woods and sky and sun and animals. And, and as you would watch creation wake up in the morning, that, as you would watch the trees shake, they're realizing that nothing that you can do can change your experience. Nothing that you can do can change you in that moment that we are just now a part of a system of a creative, unique God that I'm just a part of. And, 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 and it was relieving and it was freeing to know that 
looking out in, 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 in all of creation, looking out into nature, that there was nothing that I had to do to keep that from, to, uh, 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 to, to sustain that. that. I didn't have to make sure the sun got up in the morning. I didn't have to make sure that the leaves blew a certain way. I didn't have to make sure that, 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 that the way how the trees are now trying to preserve themselves and, 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 and get all the nutrition they can and drop off. The, I, I, there was nothing that I could do relieving control of my hands, relieving the power from my hands. I was just a part of the system of a creative God. For a moment, I just got to be his creation. I just got to be his creation. And I think that this is a healthy thing when we are, when we are fighting to fighting for that prayer life, when we're fighting for that intimacy, when we're fighting for that moment to, to be out in a space, in a place where knowing that you do not have control, but you are relying on a powerful, almighty, creative God. I got to move on. So the first idea, my first practical encouragement is I want you to, to find where you hear from God. Find where you hear from God. The second point, uh, um, unleashing your prayer life will give you strength during the battle. We're going to move through these a little bit quicker. But if you will, turn to Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 43. And I'm going to look at a story from two different writers, Matthew and Luke, are, that I'm going to read from. They're telling the same story. They're called Synoptic Gospels. But they, what they're doing is giving two different viewpoints of the same event. But they're both unique. They bring out certain things based on their experience. So I'll be reading from Matthew first. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told... The disciples sit here while I go over there and pray. Talking, uh, uh, taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and asked Peter, so you couldn't stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, take note of that, a second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And I want to encourage you to read both of these stories. But Jesus is like, look, sit here and pray. To you. I mean, he, he takes some of his disciples with him. He said, listen, I'm going through a lot. I am deeply troubled. I am stressed out. I got a lot of stuff going on. I love how, how Matthew communicates that. That shows his grief and the sorrow of Jesus. And because of that, because knowing that, knowing that stuff was about to happen, knowing that his death was on what was coming up, knowing that the end of his life was coming, he began to pray. He was in the middle of battle and I don't want to move past this moment. Like imagine you knowing that, 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 that death is around the corner for you. Imagine how you would feel if you know that, that, that around, just around the river bend is the end of your life. This is what Jesus is feeling in this moment. That's where that deep sorrow, that deep trouble comes from. So he went to the father and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, if there is any other way, if anything else can happen, let that happen. So we went back down to check on the disciples, found them sleeping. And then, like I said, a second time, Jesus went back to pray but the prayer sounded different. The first prayer that he said, Father, well, the, the second prayer he prayed was, uh, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, hey, listen, your will be done. And I want you to see the two different tones. One says, if it's possible, let it pass. The second one says, because I have to go through it, your will be done. 
what happened in the midst of those prayers. The only thing that I see in this passage is that, th that he got frustrated with the disciples because they were still asleep. But what is going on? What changed his mind? What changed his posture? And I think Luke gives the answer for, the, for, for, for this question in his account. Now, 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 Luke tells the same story, but from a different vantage point um, with more details in certain areas. And his version is much shorter, but there's two things that Luke points out, being that he was a, a doctor by trade. There was few things that he pointed out personally. Firstly, I'll read from chapter 22, verses 43. It says, the same story, a praying form following temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and began to pray, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Verse 43. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. First thing the, that could have changed his posture that Luke uh, 22, 43 points out is that an angel came and encouraged him, strengthened him. I don't know about you, but I can see that the battles that Jesus was going through because through prayer, through this is the second time this happened in, in, uh, in, in our first passion world, but this is another time that an angel had to come through and strengthen him. I can imagine the fight that he was going through, but having been strengthened by the angels, he began to pray harder. So much so that blood poured from his sweat, his sweat glands. And I want to make sure that we are reading the same event. Can you imagine the anguish? Imagine the pain. Imagine his frustration with the disciples for not staying awake. Not only that, I want you to imagine and picture this. He is literally in the fight of his life in prayer. He is pleading and praying with the Father so hard that blood is dripping from his head. This isn't a fairy tale story that you tell to your kids at night. This is an event in history, something that happened. And there's a medical term for this called, I'm going to mess this up. So if you are a doctor, don't, don't come for me. Uh, hematohydrosis. And according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, it is a condition in which capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood occurring in under uh, conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. Jesus here was so emotionally stressed that it affected him physically. And he was in prayer. He said that the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. And I wonder if we view prayer like this. Do we see the spiritual battle? Do we view prayer as a fight between uh, uh, our spirit and our flesh? A quick story. I remember when I was younger, I would stay with my grandparents in North Jersey. And um, my grandmother worked the night shift at Barnett Hospital in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, so oftentimes at night, it would be just my grandfather and I, and he would tuck me in at night. And at the, after he got done tucking me in, he would go to the foot of the bed and pray all night. Now I'm, when I say pray, I'm telling you this man would pray all night. Any that know my grandfather knows that he was one that was known for prayer. So much so, it was funny when I was a kid because I remember being in church and he would be praying and just the octaves, it would be funny to me at the time. But there was some yelling and some, and some, it, 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 like, but now looking back, I see the tussle that he was in. I see the fight that he was in. And this man would kneel at the foot of the bed and literally go to war. He he would pray for anything and everything for hours with his strong, deep, baritone Jamaican accent voice. He, 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 he would go in. I would wake up in the middle of the night. He would still be going for it. Oh, to have a prayer life like this. One that would fight the enemy with one hand and lift praise to God with the other. And I would have to assume 
I would have to assume that you do not develop a prayer life like this unless you have seen God move or expect for God to move. There was an expectation that my grandfather would go into prayer with, that he would not get up from that bed without full resolve that whatever he was praying for would come to pass. Whatever he was pleading with God for, unleashing your prayer life will give you strength in the battle. There is a fight that you are fighting knowing that whatever needs to happen can happen by the strength and the power of God. What do I mean? What does this mean for us? There are things in your life right now that you have either prayed about or, or the Lord revealed certain things for you to do, places for you to go, ministries for you to begin, people for you to minister to, foundations for you to start, donations for you to give. But because our flesh is so strong, we have not done them yet. We have said we'll do them when we get some time. We have pushed it off. We've pushed it away. We have numbed ourselves to the urgency of those matters. And I want to tell you that unleash your prayer life will strengthen you during the battle that, that that you need to go to the fight and fight that thing in prayer tell the Lord your fears tell the Lord your anxiety tell him why you haven't started yet tell him why you have not moved tell him why you have pushed it away and fight in that battle for a while because we all have that thing. We all have that thing called purpose because woven deep into the fabric of our DNA is this thing called purpose that, 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 that the, the reason that we were put on this earth, the reason that we were given to uh, appear placed on this earth. There are people that are in this world that are waiting on you. There are, you have family members that are waiting on you. There are people that are waiting on you for what you have to do that's going to impact their life. There is people that is waiting for you to open your mouth and speak life into their situation. There are people that are that are literally hanging in the balance, waiting on you to start whatever that thing is that God put on your heart. And maybe you're listening. You're on the other side like, nah, Pastor Trev, I ain't got nothing. I don't know what that thing is. I don't know what my purpose is. The beauty of prayer is that it's not just giving something, but it's getting something. It's not just talking, but it's about listening. So the first practical point was, was find a place to help you clearly hear from God. And the, um, and, and the second one here is pray and listen. Turn off your phone. Sit in this prayer. Don't try to fill the prayer with just words for words sake. Sit in this. Just sit in some silence and some solitude. And what will happen is that things will start to come to mind. You'll, you'll start to get have dreams or visions or however it will be. But, it, but, but spend some time in that quiet place, in that quiet space. But we must battle. We must unleash your prayer life because unleashing your prayer life will help you before the battle. Unleashing your prayer life will help you during the battle. And lastly, as we close, unleashing your prayer life will bring you through the battle. Unleashing your prayer life will bring you through the battle. The scene that I want to paint for us right now it's on a hill outside of the city called Golgotha. It was outside of the city gates of Jerusalem and off in the distance, you can see a man hanging on a tree. And it was only about noon, but, but still darkness was all over the place. Lonely, watching an innocent man be killed. Getting closer as he picked up his heavy head that was that was in his chest as it was wrapped with a crown of thorns. You would see Jesus dying body, bloody bruised as he as he literally took on our sins so that we could be found free in Jesus. But on his one of his last prayerful cries, he picked up his chin, looked to the skies and shouted in a triumphant voice, it is finished. It 
was the life that he lived on earth. It was the ministry that he proclaimed. It was fulfilling all of the prophecies of old. It was completing the work of salvation. It was a cry of victory to say that I win what look like a loss was actually a win. What looked grim was actually the win. When Jesus said it was finished, nothing else had to be done. When Jesus said it was finished, dead man could live again. When Jesus said it is finished, the promised plan of God had been fulfilled. Jesus' last prayer echoed to us even today because, because it is finished, I have life. Because it is finished, Finished, I can get through the battle. Because it is finished, I have communion with God. Because it is finished, the veil has been torn and my access to God is unlimited. Because it is finished, I have new life. Because it is finished, I can fight the battle. Because it is finished, my prayer life can help me in the middle of the battle. Because it is finished, my prayer life can help me get through the battle. Because it is finished. Maybe you're here today fighting, hurting, praying. Family, the work that was done on that cross is finished. And because of that work, you, you can have new life. You can walk in victory. You can walk in power. You are a unique, creative person that has been intentionally created by God. We are his workmanship created to do good works. And there are things, there are, th th there's, there's not things that you have to do because the work is already finished. I want to invite you to pray with me but unleashing your prayer life. Unleashing your prayer life will help you before the battle. Unleashing your prayer life will help you during the battle and unleashing your prayer life will help you get through the battle. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for life. We thank you for the work that you did on that cross. We thank you that now you offer us new life. Your prayer is a difficult thing. Prayer can, be, prayer can be taxing, prayer can be daunting, prayer can be frustrating. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us in that. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.